Be a disciple, Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 20, where we see an account of when Jesus called his disciples to follow him. And uh, I've got some of you ready to read some scripture verses for me this morning during the sermon. So uh, I'll be starting to call on you here before too long. So, so have those verses ready too if I've asked you to read. And Brother Jim, if you go ahead and come up and grab that cordless mic and you can have that with you. Jim's going to be my uh, gopher. He's going to take it around when someone has a verse to read. And uh, just tap that bottom button and it'll turn green and people will be able to hear you. All right, thank you. So, um, before coming on here as your pastor, um, I have done a lot of teaching online for Liberty University. I teach in their School of Divinity and one of the courses that I teach is Introduction to Church Ministries. And part of that class, we talk about this very thing, what it means to be a disciple. And uh, I want to share with you today some of the content that comes out of that. And uh, one of our textbooks for that class is called Ministry Is. It's by Dave Early and Ben Gutierrez. And Dr. Early has some very keen insights into what it means to be a disciple. And I want to use some of what's in his book to share that with you today. Now, um, when we think about following Jesus, we got to remember who Jesus was. Jesus was a Jew who grew up in a Jewish culture. He ate Jewish food and he memorized the Jewish law. He, was, he very likely went to a synagogue school and he learned the Torah. And if you're not sure what the Torah is, it's basically the first five books of our Bible which we call the Pentateuch, being five books. So uh, it included the commandments of God. And very likely Jesus, as a student, sat under the tutelage of a rabbi. And the Jewish word rabbi simply means teacher. So in the first century, it was common for gifted students to approach a rabbi and ask, May I follow you? And basically, they were asking the rabbi if he thought they had what it takes that, um, to become like him. And the rabbi either accepted the student as a disciple or sent him away to pursue a trade. But when Jesus began his public ministry, he broke that pattern when he chose his own disciples. He didn't, people didn't come up to him and said, may I follow you? He actually took the lead and he said, you follow me. So he kind of turned it upside down. In fact, in our passage this morning, let's look in Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. We'll see an example of this. In Mark Chapter 1, beginning with verse 16, it says, And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who, were also, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. So, um, when Jesus began his public ministry, he broke the pattern that was traditional in Israel where people would go to a rabbi and say, man, I follow you. He sought his disciples out and he told them, if you follow me, I will make you become fishers of men. And these men that he called here in these verses were eventually enrolled in the Jesus Discipleship Academy. And they spent three years with Jesus learning what it meant to be 
his disciples, to become like him. No longer would they just be spectators. As Jesus taught the people and performed miracles, they're not just on the sidelines watching, but they're going to literally be with him and be involved in that. Now, here we go. I'm a, somebody had Mark 3, verse 14. Uh, Jim, get ready. Okay, right across the way. Mark 3, 14. You'll read that for us. Mark 3, 14. He appointed 12, designating them apostles, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach. Thank you. So these 12 would literally be with him. And they were going to be with him for these three years. Now, Jesus, as he called them, he did not tell them to follow a set of rules or to follow a series of rituals. He told them, follow me. And to be a disciple of a rabbi was a personal relationship that involved living with him for a few years. And it was a total commitment to memorize his words and replicate his lifestyle. And so they would be with him to learn from him in order to become like him. So let's look closer at what it means to become a disciple. And the first thing I want you to note this morning of what it means to be disciple, a disciple, is that disciples receive and recite the teachings of their rabbi. They receive and they recite the teachings of their rabbi. Now, memorization, that's fun, right? <laughs> I know it can be hard sometimes, but think about all the songs you know. When you start hearing them on the radio, you just, you know the words, right? Because you hear them so often and they're catchy and you find, you figure out a way to remember those lyrics. And there's probably songs that you hear now that you knew 30, 40 plus 50 years ago, and you still know the words to those songs. And I think for some of you here today who are, who are Christians, and you've been Christians for 30, 40, 50 plus years, you know some verses from back then because they just became familiar to you. And some of you memorized them on purpose, and some of you, you didn't memorize them on purpose, but you, you read them and you heard them enough to where you are familiar with them. Well, memorization was an important learning technique in the first century. Beginning at age five, Jewish children would memorize large portions of the Torah. And as they grew older, boys learned key sections of the Old Testament, and girls learned the Psalms. And at age 12, boys would begin to apprentice and learn their father's trade. Girls would learn homemaking skills in preparation for marriage. And then sometime between the age of 12 to 18, a boy could begin an apprenticeship to become a rabbi. And if he did, if he started that apprenticeship, he would memorize the Torah, the whole thing, and much of the Old Testament, and the teachings of his rabbi. So you have the first five books of, of our Bible would be memorized. Other parts of the Old Testament, and not only those things, but other wise sayings and things that the rabbi would, would tell them. And memorization was important back then, especially because most people didn't have their own copy of the scriptures. So they either had to remember it, or they had to go to a synagogue to be able to access it. So the students of a rabbi had to memorize his words and imitate his life accurately, which is the next thing a disciple does. Not only does a disciple receive and recite the teachings of their rabbi, but a disi disciples replicate the lifestyle of their rabbi. They le replicate the lifestyle of their rabbi. The followers of a rabbi not only memorized his words, but they also imitated his life. 
So I think someone here has Luke 6, verse 40. Who's got that? All right, you can get that much over to Margo there. Luke 6, verse 40. The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. There you go. So the disciple is going to become like his master. And that's what that verse is telling you. Back in 175 BC, Rabbi Ben Sirach said that the goal of a rabbi is to train his students to such an extent that when his rabbi dies, it is though he is not dead. For he leaves behind him one like himself. So a disciple wants to be like the teacher, to become what the teacher is, and eventually those disciples would become disciples who would disciple others in the same way. Jesus' disciples would live out his teaching in his presence so that he could comment and evaluate their conduct. Do you remember the time he sent them out among the towns and the villages and they came back and reported what had happened? That's one example of a time where he had trained them and he had taught them and he sent them out. Okay, go do this little exercise and come back and we're going to review, we're going to talk about it. So to follow uh, him in that way, they would come back, he would comment on what happened and evaluate how it went. And to follow Jesus meant they had to become like Jesus. They, in fact, they were so much like Jesus that when anyone observed their conduct or listened to them speak, they would immediately know who their rabbi was. So how about you? Is it obvious to everyone around you that Jesus is your rabbi? Is he your teacher? Are you his disciple? So, disciples receive and recite the teachings of their rabbi. They replicate the lifestyle of their rabbi. And then the third thing they do is disciples reproduce the life of the rabbi in others. Now, one day at the Sea of Galilee, Jesus called Peter, Andrew, James, and John, we just read that here in Mark 1, to follow him. And if they did, Jesus told them, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. I will teach you to fish for people. And so Jesus tied what they knew as a, as a, a lifestyle, as a, as a profession, they knew fishing. He tied that with what they needed to learn, and that was how to catch people with the gospel. Seeking people to follow Jesus would take the same care, the same dedication, and the same skill that they needed in fishing. They would need to develop the compassion for lost people that Jesus had. And what they learned was not to stop with them. It must continue on into the lives of others. And if they were to be his disciples, they were going to have to disciple other people. So I have someone queued up to read Matthew 28, 18 through 20. I think up here, Jim, Pastor Rick. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the ends of the earth. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the ages. Amen. Thank you, brother. So, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. 
That's part of what it means to learn. To, when he's making disciples, part of making one is teaching them to observe those things. So disciples receive and recite the teachings of their rabbi. They replicate the lifestyle of their rabbi. They reproduce the life of the rabbi in other people. And then the fourth thing that they do is they replace their previous life with the new life of their rabbi. They come just like him. They do what he did. They, they represent him. So when we look back here in our text in Mark 1, 16 through 20, while it is important to know that these men did answer Jesus' call to follow him, it's also important to notice how they answered his call. And in, in, in verse 18, it says, they immediately left their nets. It was immediate. They didn't hem all around and think about, well, what would mom think? Or, uh, you know, what's everybody going to say if we leave this work and we go and follow this guy? Um, so they, they did it immediately. And then in verse 20, it, it tells us they left their father in the boat. I mean, they just walked off. It says they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants. I mean, they were not just putting down their nets for an afternoon or for a few days. They were leaving their nets for the rest of their lives. So in order to say yes to following Jesus, they had to say goodbye to their careers as fishermen. And to some degree to their families. I mean, they left Zebedee in the boat And for some of them, following Jesus would mean dying for their faith. James, John's brother, was beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross. <clears throat> and John died at an older age, but after he had been beaten, burned in exile. So ministry is following Jesus. And it's fishing for people. And I'm glad some of you this week said, yeah, I invited somebody to church. That's, that's part of fishing for people. Did anybody buy it? I don't know. But you put it out there. You can't catch a fish. You don't throw the line out in the water, right? I've never done that. Of course, now I have seen these dumb Asian carp now they have in these rivers where you're just going down in a boat and they just jump out of the water into the boat. I mean, that's, that's crazy. But that's pretty rare around these parts at least. Fish don't usually just jump in the boat. But ministry is following Jesus and fishing for people. It's being a disciple and it's making disciples. It's growing and going. It's learning and evangelizing. It's knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and it's leading others to know him in that way too. That's what it means to follow Jesus. That's what it means to be a disciple. And I think most of you here today would say that, that you're saved. You would say that Jesus is your Lord and your Savior, that you're a disciple, you're a follower of, of Christ. Amen. And I'm glad, and that's great, and I praise God for that. But what should that mean? If you're saying, yes, I'm a disciple of Christ, what that should mean is that you are in God's word often, and that you're growing and learning in your faith. You're receiving and reciting the words of your rabbi. It should also mean that you're becoming more like Christ in thought, word, and deed. It means that as you grow in your faith, that you start filtering everything you read, hear, think, and do through the Word of God. And you often think about, well, what would Jesus do? How would he respond? What's the, the biblical, Christ-like play in this situation? What does Scripture say about this? Is this true? Is this right? What's, should I or should I not do this? So let God's word dwell in you richly. Hide God's word in your heart so that you may not sin against him. 
So if you're saved and you're following Jesus, that should also mean that you're actively praying for, seeking out, and sharing with others the good news about Jesus Christ. Now some of you might be like, Oof, that's really not, that's not the way I'm wired. My personality is like, I'm just not an outgoing kind of evangelistic type person. Well, everybody can do something. I really believe that. I don't care if you're homebound. You can do something. You can pray for people. You can pick up the phone. You can talk to people. You can write people. There's some way you can have some kind of impact. And so, you know, th there's this spectrum of people in the church. You, you've got the, the non-evangelist Christians. Those are the people that are like, I'm really not a good speaker. I really can't do much. I don't feel like that I'm very effective. And, I, and maybe the best you can do is be a good neighbor and show care and, and talk about praying and asking your, your neighbor, well, you know, I go to church and, and we pray. Is there anything we can do to pray for you? I mean, just a little something. And, and so maybe that's you, or maybe you grow a garden in the summer. You can share some stuff with your neighbors. Uh, maybe you can just hand somebody a gospel tract or say, you know, or invite someone to church. Huh? And then there's your, 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 your people that are in between, in the middle. It's like you're an occasional evangelist. In other words, you're like, you know, if the stars line up and everything works out just right, then I'll say something. I'm not afraid to, it's just that it has to be the right situation. And that might be some of you. Because you're not really afraid, but you know, it just has to be just right. And then you're green light, you're all in, and you'll do it. And then there's those, I would call them rare, outgoing evangelist type people who they just somehow, they're, they're able to turn every situation, every conversation into a gospel conversation, just naturally. I am not that person. <laughs> I wish I was. I wish I had the, the skills and ability to do that. But I, I'm just not. But there are those people. And if that's you, then praise God. I mean, do what you're doing and keep doing it. Keep living for Christ and keep sharing the gospel. Um, but but that's, that's what it means to... If, in other words, I guess what I'm trying to say here then is if you're saved and following Jesus, then then you ought to be actively praying for, seeking out, and sharing with others the good news of Jesus Christ. And the way that you can do it. Now, I would have a red flag going off in my mind if you have no concern at all for, for people that don't know Christ. If you think, I don't care, let them die and burn in hell. If that's your attitude, then there's probably an issue with your salvation. Because... We know that the Lord sent Jesus to, to die on the cross to save everyone who would ever believe in him. And so we want the gospel to be shared with as many people as possible. And if you don't have a burden for lost people, I'm not sure if you're saved. Either that or you really got some growing to do. It's, it's one of those. Well, finally, if, if you're truly a disciple of Christ, you can no longer live for yourself. You cannot live any way you want to live and call yourself a Christian. God's word tells us that anyone who wishes to follow after Christ must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow Jesus. In fact, Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, by, I, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God's word tells us that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. You were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So what does this look like? What should you be doing as you follow Christ? Well, I've already mentioned them, but I'll do it real quick. You need to regularly feed 
on God's Word. That's the first thing. Regularly feed on God's Word. In fact, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4 says this. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's how important it is. If you really want to truly live as a Christian, live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Somebody here has John 14, 26. Uh, up front here, uh, Jim, this Joan over here has uh, John 14, 26. There you go. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Thank you. So if you regularly feed on God's Word, the Holy Spirit will bring that back to your remembrance when you need it. God will remind you and give you that. And then the second thing is that we need to live like Jesus wants us to live. Not only privately, but also publicly. And that's 1 John 2, verses 3 through 6. Is that you, Jim? Okay. Okay, 1 John 2, 3 through 6. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought also to walk in the same way which he walked. So we need to be living like Jesus commands us to live, in public and in private. And then we need to share the gospel and make disciples. And I think Miss Yuba has this one, John 20, 21. Is that you? Share the gospel and make disciples. They have heard about your teaching, that you tell our people who live among the nations to leave the law of Moses. They have heard that you tell them not to circumcise their children and not to obey customs. Thank you. And then to exhibit, the fourth and final thing is to exhibit a truly converted life. Show that following Christ is the most important thing in your life. And remember, and this is a quote that, have any of you ever heard of Pastor John Piper? Any of you ever heard of him? Okay. He's pretty well known for this quote. He says that God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in Him. So let's see what 2 Corinthians 5.15 says. And I think over here, Miss Allie has that one. Alright. This is a great verse, y'all. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 5.15. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Thank you. He died so that we should no longer live for ourselves, but for him who rose for us and who lives for us. <laughs> so as I close out this message today and again thank you all who read today thank you so much i appreciate your help and jim thanks for getting the mic around everybody uh, if there's someone here today who has not yet trusted in jesus as your lord and savior i invite you to do so this morning and here's why you need to receive jesus as the lord and savior of your life in case you don't know the Bible says that you're a sinner and that you've broken God's law. And the penalty for breaking God's law is death. 
The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Now, when I talk about death, I'm not talking about ceasing to exist. I'm talking about the exact opposite of eternal life. The penalty, the wages of sin is eternal death in hell for the sinner who does not repent and believe in Jesus. Why? Because your sin, however trivial or minuscule you think it is, has been committed against the holy, righteous, and eternal God who created you and blessed you with many good things in your life, whether you understand or realize that or not. But God is loving and gracious, and he has done something so that anyone who trusts in Jesus can be saved. You see, the Bible says that Jesus lived a perfect life and yet was crucified on a cross for our sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And he rose again on the third day. We broke God's law, but Jesus paid our fine. And the Bible says that whoever believes in Jesus, whoever trusts in him, will not die eternally, but will have everlasting life. In fact, Jesus delivers us from the power of darkness and brings us into his kingdom. And in him, the Bible says, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So if you desire to trust in Christ today, in a moment, we're going to sing a song. And while we sing that last song, if you feel like you're ready to trust in Christ and make it public, step out of your seat and come forward and tell me about it. And I will help you and guide you to take your next step. And if you're not comfortable with that, if you're like, mm, I don't know about stepping out, walking forward and all that, then see me after church or connect with me some other way. The contact info is on the bulletin. If you look at the front page, you can see phone numbers. You can see email. You can text me at, at uh, my 708-5780 number. Um, but I want to help you if, if you are seeking and you want answers. Maybe other people here today, maybe you need to repent and confess uh, your sin of lukewarmness and disobedience to God and His Word. You, you say, well, I'm a disciple of Christ, but yet you know really deep down in your heart that you're not following Him as you know He would want you to. So maybe you would want to come just kneel and pray and just kind of make things right with the Lord. You can do that where you are if you want. But sometimes showing others that you mean business with the Lord and coming forward will encourage them to pray for you and it will encourage you to keep your commitment. And then finally, there could be others here this morning who the Lord is telling you to join this church and start serving in here. So let's bow and pray and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll close out with a final song. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your word today. And we ask, Lord, that you will have your will and your way with us right now. Let us not lie, but let us tell the truth as we sing this last song. And may its words express the true desire of our hearts. And Lord, we ask you to move among us now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Ms. Joan, come and lead us in our closing hymn.